thank you for your interest in gender dignity, unique and equal. I'm your host, Matthew Francis, and tonight we have a very special guest, Gia Drew. She is the Program Director for Equality Maine and the president, uh, Board President of Maine Transnet. And I have a unique story about Gia myself. Um, as some of you know, when I came out, I was a very scared person. And the first trans person that I ever met, to the best of my knowledge, was actually Gia Drew. I was very scared, and I was going to a Maine Transnet meeting. And I just remember the compassion and the warmth and the greeting. I remember her just tremendous facilitation skills. And I remember having the courage to actually want to address the group. And in the middle of it, I had a panic attack. And Gia just piped right up and said, is there anyone else in this room who feels unsure of themselves? So Gia has always been special to me because she made me feel tremendously welcomed. And I remember having a lot of transphobia and thinking, she looks so normal. <laughs> and that is part of what I'm here to do, is to introduce you viewers to just normal, ordinary folks. So without further ado, I am going to start off with asking Gia if she wouldn't mind sharing a bit about her life and um, her childhood, and then we're going to go from there. Great. Well, thank you, Matthew. It's really great to be here tonight thank on you. your show. Um, and I do want to address what you just said in your really kind remarks about coming to our your support group meeting in, at Maine Transnet. Um, Maine Transnet's a nonprofit that provides support, education, and resources to the transgender community. We've been doing that for about nine years. Mm -hmm. and, and like you, I went to my first support group meeting probably six or seven years ago and was terrified. Really? Myself. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, I really, like you, I probably had never met another trans person knowingly. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know what to expect, mm -hmm. you know. And so I was, had a lot of anxiety, a lot of apprehension. Um, and I can say that that first meeting that I went to probably saved my life. Um, and so that's why I continue to work with Maine Transgender Network, known as Maine Transnet, because I know how important it is for transgender people to not feel alone in the world. Mm. Um, and I think that's something that is really important. Um, so important to feel welcomed, to have a safe space, and not just safe, but welcoming space. That's good. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, mm -hmm. I think we work really hard to make sure that people who come, because we don't know where they're coming from and where they are in their life, mm -hmm. um, to try to make that space as safe as possible. And that's, mm -hmm. That can be hard and challenging, depending on the location of the space, how many people are in the group. Um, Which has grown enormously, hasn't it? When I first yeah. was attending, I remember there really being a handful of sure. people. Yes. That's a really good point. You know, when... When I started attending Maine Transnet's group probably seven, eight years ago, I remember that first meeting, like I said, I went upstairs, it was in an office, and I went and knocked on the door and I came in and there were these three guys sitting around, like eating Doritos and having takeout. <laughs> and I'm like, is this the right place? <laughs> in my head, I didn't really think about trans guys. Mm. In my head, I always thought about my own experience and, and trans women and things like that. Mm -hmm. And here are these three guys hanging out on these couches and they said, yeah, this is me, Transnet. Come on in. And I'm like, great. You know, and these three people are, have really been really instrumental in, in my own journey. Mm. They made me feel so welcome and so sort of normal. Okay. Like there were just some guys who are hanging out who happen to be trans. Um, yeah. In that meeting, there were four of us. You know, and over the last, you know, six or seven years, the group mm. has evolved and changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, our, our groups are in Portland, but also Bangor, Lewiston, and Brunswick right now, mm -hmm. and some of our groups are more than 30 people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes. and that's a challenge in itself to make sure to create that safety and that welcome yeah. space for such a large group. But I think there's a lot going in the world, um, a lot of good opportunities for trans people, and definitely a lot more visibility. So yes, I think we're going to get to that a little bit later. But yeah. I'd like to go back with your, yeah. your question. That's <laughs> fine. I was hoping that you'd be willing to share a bit about your life. And to be honest, if you don't mind, um, yeah. as you feel comfortable, sharing even about your childhood. Sure. Um, That's, well, thanks for, thanks for asking. You know, um, I do get the chance to talk a little bit about my life because of my work. And yes. as you said, I'm the program director at Equality Maine, in addition to being the president of Maine Transnet. And a lot of the work I do with Equality Maine is going out and and speaking in public mm -hmm. about my experience, but also bringing other people along and they can share their experience. I do a lot of professional development for schools and educators so they know how to better support students in schools. Mm -hmm. I also do that with businesses and organizations mm -hmm. and also as an advocate at the State House. So oh. I do have some experience sharing my story okay. um, with people. And I think that's so important so people understand that transgender people are people 
but each of us has our own story and each of us has their own journey. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I, I can speak a little bit about all my past and how it connects to the work I do today. I think that might oh, be Oh, I'd love that, yes. Okay, great. You know, so when I was little, or young, I should say, uh, I was born in the 60s, okay. you know, many, many years ago. I'm nearly 50 years old. And by the time I was three or four, I knew I was a lot more like my sisters, okay. Christine and Ellen, and my mom, other than my four brothers and my dad. Okay. You know, oh, I already, that's a large family. Yeah, I grew up in a yeah. family of nine. Okay. I have six brothers and sisters. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but I knew pretty quickly okay. that there was something unique about me. I was really interested in their things, who they played with, the items they played with, the clothes mm -hmm. they wore, the mm -hmm. jewelry my mom had, or makeup. And I constantly found myself attracted to those items. Okay. Yeah. And I would sort of steal them or borrow them. Yeah. And I'm sure I got corrected along the way. I don't have a really great memory, but I'm sure someone said, hey, put, take that off. That's, boys don't do that or right. whatever when I was a kid. I don't have a really good memory of that. Okay. But I do know I, have, I had some, some shame around what I was doing, so I started to keep it a secret. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you know, and I talk to a lot of trans people, and many people have this experience when they're three, four, where they start to experiment and express their own identity out mm -hmm. in the world, and the people around them correct them. Yes, yes. You know, and I don't have a great memory of it, um, but I do have an idea that I was probably corrected because I kept hiding it from people. Right. You know. So can you talk a little bit about, I'm interested because often I hear parents, you know, wanting to be supportive of their children sure. and they're concerned that maybe this is just a phase. Yeah. Could you go into that a bit? Sure, definitely. You know, I work with a lot of families and young people and, and, and the parents have that exact question all the time. Okay. And so when I was about 11 or 12, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was still stealing my sister's clothes and trying to dress a little in private. You know, I would even wear maybe some clothes under my, like, boy clothes to school. Okay. Things like that. Yeah. And, um... But my parents found out. They, they found my little stash of girl clothes under okay. my bed and stuff, and they confronted me about it. Oh. Yeah. And, and I was embarrassed. They, they actually brought me to the backyard to talk about it. Okay. There was, there was really the only place in my house where there was any privacy. Okay, so such a big like, house. Yeah, such a big <laughs> So we went to my backyard, and uh, they wanted to know what was going on. Why was I doing this? Why was I behaving like this? And um, they were concerned. I could tell they were a little embarrassed or awkward because they didn't have a language. You know, right. This is in the, in the late 70s, probably, at this point. And, you know, I didn't have an answer for them, other than um, it makes me feel good. Okay. You know, it makes me happy when I do this. And they kind of shook their heads. And they're like, I don't know what this is. We're confused. Would you like to talk to a priest about it, was their response. Okay. Um, I didn't want to talk to anyone about it <laughs> right, <laughs> at right. that point as an 11-year-old. I was just embarrassed that they found out, and I'm humiliated. I'm like, no. Um, and so what I think I did, I, I'm going to guess that I said, I probably, I'll never do it again. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. just so I wouldn't have to talk to anyone about it. Yeah. You know, and at that place, you know, the idea of therapy or talking to anyone in mental health or a doctor wasn't there. My family's very religious and still sure. is. Yeah. Um, and so they would turn to the church for their answers. Okay, right. And so they thought turning to a priest I would get some sort of comfort in that, but I just said, no thanks, and I'm good. And that you're not just not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again, yeah. which is a complete lie. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I'm okay with that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I continued doing it in private, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it took another 30 some years until I actually came out to my parents to tell them, you know, that time we talked in the backyard, that never went away. That wasn't a phase. That wasn't just something I was curious about. Mm -hmm. That was really my identity. Um, and so it's really interesting to look back now it's when I was a little kid trying to put the words together, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a different world today, you know, and when I meet with young people today, there's a lot more information out there for yes, young people. Yes. There's the internet, there's YouTube, and, you know, and parents have more information to grapple with and education around that. And so I think I was in, you know, a unique place back in the 60s and 70s when there really wasn't a lot of information. I feel very fortunate. I think my parents could have acted very differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I know sure. many people where parents have done horrible things mm -hmm. to their kids um, when they've acted or behaved out of the norm or dressing like a girl. Mm. And so for my parents just to let it go yeah. like that and drop it was pretty cool. <laughs> you that know, is very lucky. Especially back then. Yes, especially. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. So how did you... So, this feeling was growing. Sure. 
and you're going through adolescence. Oh, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about how, <laughs> you know, were you struggling with dysphoria? Some people do not. Um, sure, you know, and so for those who don't know, dys dysphoria is a term we use um, to talk about sort of the incongruence or discomfort between someone's body and their, and their physical sense of self, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't know that word at age 11 or 12. I didn't know yeah, it until I was right, in my 40s. Right. Yeah. Um, but I did notice that my body was different than my sisters or things like that. And, you know, like, oh, that's weird. Okay. And then, but when puberty comes on, it's, it's hell for anybody. Yes. Right? Um, but it's really tough if you're trans because your body starts to change rapidly into something that you don't want it to do. It feels like it's betraying you almost. Yeah. Mm. It, sure. Mm. You know, and I, and I think you start to course with these hormones that don't feel right with you. And right. for me, the hormones were testosterone. Mm. And I, I remember very clearly these really uncomfortable feelings. Okay. Probably, you know, like, why? Why is this happening? Questioning it. Um, trying to find some solace yep. around that. Yep. Uh, and it was troubling. It became very troubling for me. Dating was never very successful. Mm -hmm. You know, I dated some girls, not with much success or okay. any longevity, because um, I was still very uncomfortable with my own body. Sure. Sure. Um, and I kind of made it through high school, but it was rough. Okay. It was rough because that, that person inside of me, that whatever it was, that girl at the time, um, there wasn't space for me to be out. Mm -hmm. You know, there, I didn't have any friends who were out. I didn't have any teachers who were out. There weren't any role models, you know. Mm -hmm. And I do remember this one story, if I may share. Absolutely. Um, you know, I was, um, and I think this, at one point I decided to be more like my brothers. Yep. To fit in, not to get picked on. And so I, I led, I kind of followed their ways into sports, into football, um, and to be a leader in school and all these things. Um, and here I was, a senior in high school. Okay. I was senior class president, captain of the track team, captain Ooh. of the football team. <laughs> um, and no one really knew that deep down inside of me there really was a girl. Mm. And uh, I remember one day, it was Valentine's Day in my senior year in high school, and uh, someone had sent me a pink carnation. Like they do. I don't know if they, yeah. someone sent the flowers when you were in high school yes. at all. Yeah, it's pretty common. And so someone sent me a print carnation, and I thought, what the heck? I want to wear this carnation on my white sh button shirt. No big deal, right? And so I went to my first few classes, no big deal. And then I went down to the cafeteria for lunch. Um, and then I noticed my crowd of like buddies. You know, I had a couple different groups of people. I had sure. my sort of more academic friends, but then I also had my jockey friends. Sure. And, you know, and I noticed they kind of looked at me and one of my friends, let's call him Tony. Okay. <laughs> uh, kind of looked at me and he noticed that I was wearing this pink flower. And he came right up to me and, and the crowd of people kind of spread out a little bit. And he was very loud about it. Mm. And he kind of pointed at me and said, what the F do you think you doing, you sissy? Oh, my. And he went and he reached for my pink flower. And he goes, what are you, uh, you know, a faggot? Mm -hmm. It's a really hard word for me to say. Sure. Um, and he reached and he grabbed the pink flower and ripped it off my shirt. And in doing so, ripped open my shirt. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Exposing my, like, you know, chest and my heart underneath. And I don't think he knew what he was doing. I just, you know, I think he was making fun of me for wearing a pink carnation. He had no idea what that really meant to me. Mm -hmm. You know, how powerful it was to me just to show a little bit of that girl inside of me. And I was crushed. I would think so. So that would even almost uh, solidify your attempts, I would think, maybe to fit in as a... Cis yeah, you male. Know, and so what I did was knowing the only approach I knew, having now been more like my brothers and the other guys, is I attacked him. Yep. I started a fight. Okay. Right. It got kind of violent, and we got separated by principals and got sent to the office and calmed down a little bit. And the principal said, "Tony, why'd you do that? Gia, why'd you hit Tony? You know." Yeah. And and I guess the worst part of all that is I couldn't tell them why I was so angry. Mm. There wasn't a space for me to say, you know, that flower really was me. Right. That was the girl inside of me. You right. know, my mom came to pick me up because I was getting suspended. And she goes, why do you keep getting in trouble? And this was not the first time okay. where I sort of got in trouble for arguing or getting into a fight. Um, and I couldn't tell my mom either. I couldn't tell her that, mm. you know, I was really upset about that flower was me. You know, and so what that did, it buried my identity even deeper. I can see that, sure. Yeah. And so, you know, I kind of... That was kind of another way for me to step back and move forward in my life, but also push that identity deeper. Even me. deeper. Yeah. yeah.
Yes. Wow, Gia. Um, I'm wondering then, because you came out later, as I did, in, the, in your 40s, sure. late mid-40s, yeah. weren't you? Mm -hmm. um, can I ask then, uh, you know, what, what did it take for you to step forward? I mean, what, was there anything incremental or just a moment of clarity? I right. mean, what, what got your courage up to do this? You know, a lot of people say, gee, you're so brave. And I hear this about all sorts of trans people, I hear sure. this all the time. You, you're so brave. And it doesn't quite fit or sit with me very well. Okay. Yeah, you know, and I'm just trying to be me. Okay. But I think by the time I reached 43 or something, whatever it was, I was exhausted. From keeping up this false persona? I, I, for a couple of things. Okay. You know, running from who I really was, yep. carrying two identities. Um, and I'd lived with depression for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Not uncommon for us trans folks. Yeah it's, yeah, it's true, and it's unfortunate, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I've had bouts of depression and sadness, and I've had a couple different suicide attempts oh. along the way, unfortunately, or fortunately that I'm still here. Um, and so by the time I got to 43, I'd been married for tw nearly 20 years. Oh my goodness, okay. I'd been a high school teacher for nearly 20 years. Mm. Um, and I'd been Gia on the inside all that time. That never went away. Okay. You know, and I found some little moments along the way to give myself some hope, but then it would all go back, like in the closet, as we say. Right. By the time I reached 40, though, I think I realized that I was exhausted and I had to make a decision because I wasn't happy. And I was trying to find happiness in other things mm -hmm. my job, and maybe mm -hmm. my relationships or my family, but it really wasn't satisfying. And so um, I decided. I think this is who I am, but I didn't know yet. I wasn't completely sure. Okay. You know, I met with a therapist to deal with my marriage problem, and that soon led to understanding more about my gender identity. Okay. And it was suggested I go to Maine Transnet. <laughs> okay. And meet some other trans people, see how that feels, and, and I did. And I'm like, wow, hey, that's me. Okay. And I got to see myself reflected back at me for really the first time in some other transgender people, and that really helped. I imagine it did. I'm curious myself, um, did you know you were trans and that you, um, see in my situation I didn't know I was trans. Yeah. Um, this was something, unfortunately I'd internalized sort of that I was a freak of some yeah. sort. Sure. And I'm wondering, did you know the term? Did you know what was going on? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the word transgender is actually pretty recent yeah. in terms of our own vernacular and how we use it. So when I was growing up, that wasn't the word. Okay. You know, I grew up hearing words like transvestite, transsexual, things okay. like that. Yes. Um, and so when I remember in college, actually, I went to Syracuse University, and I remember, you know, going into the science, they had a separate library for science. Okay. And I remember going through the stacks, the card catalog. Yes, before way back, yes, yeah, way right, back before computers were... <laughs> We are dating ourselves. <laughs> oh, well. And I came across, I was really curious about my own, like, identity. Sure. And I came across, you know, sexual deviations, abnormalities, and I came across chapters in magazines on transvestism and transsexualism and things like that. And I was just hungry for knowledge. Yeah. And there I was like getting these magazines and these publications and psychology books and stuff and trying to learn a little bit about me. And it really did help because it gave me some sort of at least some foundation. Yeah, a framework. Too. A framework yeah. that there, there was other people like me, that this word exists. And back then it was transsexual, transvestite. Um, but it wasn't all positive. I was going to say, as you were talking, what hit me, what struck me is that it was deviant. That it was, yeah. right, that it, um, I mean, even diagnosing it on some level to me indicates, you know, there's something wrong with you. Oh, sure. Back in yeah. the 80s, it was still a sort of diagnosis of deviancy or sexual abnormality. And it was something to be overcome. Yeah. Was it? Exactly. Yeah. You know, the idea that this can be fixed or mm -hmm. something. You know, right. That you're damaged, you need to be fixed. And so... I mean, I did learn about the word, but, you know, and so during college I did sort of play around with what does that mean, but I also started, like, maybe I'm gay. Right. And so I, and in college I actually started dating guys. Yeah. And I was presenting as a guy, I started dating guys, and that was actually, that was pretty satisfying to some level. But once sure. again, with my whole body and not feeling, you know, comfortable with that, nothing really progressed that deeply or, or long. Um, and so it wasn't until, you know, later in the, in the late 90s or that I started hearing the word transgender. Okay. You know, and sort of like reading more about it on my own. Internet started growing and it started to sort of, you could start to listen to transgender people talking on YouTube. Yep. And it was really inspiring to see people around the world, different ages, young people, old people, mm -hmm. talking about their experiences. And that really did help me. 
just understand what transgender meant. Now I'm going to ask you because this comes up in my own personal life and it's come up in some of my interviews. What would you tell someone, and you're a great person to ask, yeah. uh, what is the difference between someone who's gay sure. and someone who knows that they're trans, that, they're, that, that this is different sure. than being homosexual? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think for a long time, people kind of push the two together. Yes. Right? That if you're trans, that you're gay. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a young boy and you dress like a girl, that you're femme, you're probably right. going to be gay. Mm -hmm. Or it's going to make you gay, or things right. like that. You know? And what we know now, you know, with the science and lived experiences from talking to people, is that most of us were born with different sure. identities, multiple identities. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a separate identity that is around our, our biology and our sex that forms really early. We have another identity about our sexual orientation and attraction that mm -hmm. forms at a different time and place. Yep. And our own sort of personal identity or maybe gender identity forms at a different time and place as well. In fact, they're, they really are separate things. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of lump them together very often because we talk about LGBT and they kind right, of the, clump together. But yep. when we look at it, they really are separate things. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I always thought they're kind of all connected. Right. And so for me, um, I've always known now that, you know, after college, that my sexual identity in terms of my sexual orientation or attraction is I'm comfortable identifying as bisexual. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had relationships and I'm attracted to men and women and all genders, actually. Yeah. Um, but that is completely separate than my own identity as a, right. as a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really understand that. I always thought they were connected. And so it wasn't until I was 40 some years old that I realized, wait, this is different. This is different. Yeah. This is a different feeling that my true gender identity is a woman or mm -hmm. is a girl. Um, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's always been there. Right. But now I get a chance to actually be Own it, it openly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. I like, I like understanding that there is a difference between those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I look at those terms, I see them as sort of different worlds. Yeah, and the idea that even gender expression, which is a different level, Mm -hmm. is how we sort of express ourselves to the world outwardly or display it. Mm -hmm. And so in my case, and in many trans people's cases, um, where maybe they didn't feel safe or they weren't, mm -hmm. didn't know their identity, they maybe express themselves differently. And so right. for most of my life, for my own safety, I expressed it in a more masculine way. Sure, sure. Um, and now I kind of have a more, more feminine spin to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a different sort of side to a gender. And that's a lot more society-based. Yes. You know, the idea of what are society norms and roles and all that stuff. And that's more about my expression and the way I dress, the way yep. I talk, maybe the roles I have or the name I have. Okay. But my true gender identity has been with me the, the whole, whole time. time. Yep. Now I just get to be one. Yes. Right? I love it. Um, and it's hard for me because I, I have had people say, you know, why didn't you just, you know, become a butch lesbian? Why isn't, sure. why isn't that? And you know, explaining, but um, it really wasn't anything to do with the attraction. It was how I saw myself in the world right. and the way people perceived me. Mm -hmm. um, so um, thank you for that explanation. Yeah. And, and there's a little bit to that. I think there's been a history mm -hmm. for transgender people over time. There was this expectation and there were these rules that we had to follow. We don't, yes. it's different nowadays, th mm -hmm. thankfully, but there was this plan you had to go through if you were going to transition. You had to like disappear from the world. Mm, you had yes. to go live as this other, other identity to prove this is who you are. Then, only then, after a year or two, would they allow you to take hormones. Right. And only right. then, with doctor's notes and everything, were you allowed to, if you needed it, some surgical intervention. Sure. Right. And then, it was expected, if you were switching genders, you would be dating the opposite sex. Right. Be very binary in my mind, probably. And historically yeah. heteronormative. Yes. Right. Right. Exactly. And I think we've loosened up the criteria um, <laughs> significantly. Right. And um, maybe you can explain too to the viewers um, queer, yeah. the, the concept of sure. gender queer and fluid. Are you comfortable doing that? I'm, I, I can okay. give it a shot. Okay. Which is hard because I don't identify as queer myself right. personally. Yep. Um, and when I was a kid, or even recently, queer was a, a negative term. Yes. You know, if I have only recently uh, been able to use it myself. Sure. Yes. Understandably, some yeah. of us were used in really horrible ways. Right. You know, the F word, the, being called queer or whatever, mm -hmm. or sissy. Um, but just like some other marginalized communities, the word queer has been reclaimed by yes. many people in the, in the larger LGBT community. Yep. As, as a source of power. Mm -hmm. It's also a, a political way of looking at gender identity or sexual orientation or sex. 
Um, and so you'll hear the word queer in a more positive way. Yes. And yes. so the idea of a queer community is mm -hmm. being positive, or my queer identity being that maybe I don't really relate to the binary system of male or female, or sexual orientation being straight or gay or mm -hmm. bi. Yep. I identify, some people identify as queer, and it mm -hmm. could be queer in terms of their sexuality, or it could be queer in terms of their gender identity. So it's an umbrella term? Um, it can be. It doesn't okay. always that way. Okay. You know, I know some people who say, I'm a transgender woman, and I'm queer. Okay. And queer. Maybe saying to refer to their sexual orientation. I got you. But there are some people who say that I'm a lesbian, and I'm genderqueer. Okay. Maybe. And they mean their identity. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a pretty fluid term. But it's once again, it's an identity, so it's not a label we want to put on somebody right. without knowing who they are. Right. And so that I think that is important to recognize that we don't use these terms for other people. Right. We use them to identify ourselves. Because what transgender means to me is my own idea and understanding what yep. it may mean to you, may mean something different. I agree. And, and when I get asked questions like that, I just say, you know, ask the person what it means to them. Sure. You know, clarify it with them. Um, because for me, um, I don't use the term queer. And, yeah. I, and, and so if someone's using it, it can mean different things to different people. So, yeah. great. Um, I know that <laughs> you are working on a book. Wow. I also know... Um, a lot of people talk about wanting to write books, sure. and it takes, in my opinion, a tremendous amount of discipline and intellectual stamina. And I'm curious about your book, if it's a memoir, mm -hmm. and where you're at on the process, and, and what you'd like to share with us. Sure. Thanks, Matthew, for bringing that up. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I've been writing for most of my life. Okay. You know, and I, I've looked back, and my mom has been wonderful. She saved some of my early writings. I remember. I remember writing in second grade in Mrs. Dukakis's class at Cabot Elementary School. Oh, I love outside it. Outside of Boston, <laughs> right? And she broke all the rules in the book, you know. But the one thing I do remember is she really encouraged us to write. Mm. You know, and I think I, some of my fondest memories are in her class because she didn't say no to me as a young boy back then, presenting boy. Mm -hmm. But I was writing some of the most sort of flowery, girly things <laughs> in the world as this little, like, seven-year-old. And I was writing the most sort of like uh, flowery poetry about earth and nature and all these pretty things um, without saying I'm a girl, but it was really there in those in the words. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, you know, I moved on and became an artist. I studied art in high school and college and became an art teacher. But words and, and writing were always part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really part and part of my life. And so when I began transitioning uh, six years ago or so, uh, my therapist encouraged me to say, hey, why don't you keep drawing, but also mm -hmm. maybe doing some journaling mm -hmm. about the process. That might help sort of get out some of your frustrations or just get some words on the page. And so it became a habit for me. Every morning before going to school, mm -hmm. I get up right from like between 5 and 6 a.m. Oh, what discipline. <laughs> it, yes. it does. I think yeah. writing or any yeah. art form yes. um, is a discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, it's getting to it every day and working on it. It's work. Mm. And so yes, it became it very practiced at it and filled up books and books and books and books of stuff. Stuff I haven't really even gone back to. Okay. And after a few years, um, after I decided to come out and start being public about it, someone said, these are, I shared a couple stories to the audiences and said, that's a pretty cool story. You might want to like share that with the world mm. in a blog. Oh, okay. And so I started this blog called Girl Afraid. Okay. Uh, probably a year into my transition. And at first I was writing probably three or four blogs a month. Okay. Now I hope to get one a month. Yeah. But over the time, I've written probably you know, um, 500 pages. Wow. Uh, of stories and articles reflecting back on my growing up, what it's like today as a middle-aged trans woman in society. Some of my travels around uh, the United States as a trans person. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been really great. I get great feedback when I share mm -hmm. stories. Um, I have an audience now that's reached about 30,000 people. Wow. Um, which is really encouraging. Yeah. And all sports of the world. The internet's incredible. You look at your map on where people have been connecting to your blog, and there are people all over the world, you know, oh, okay. so, in like Russia and Latvia and oh, Germany. Oh, I love and, it. It's like, it's really, you know, heartwarming to know that there are people out there yeah. reading your story Yeah. Um, that you didn't, really didn't think was worthy, yeah. you know. Um, and so I sort of cultivated that, and I spent some more time on the craft of writing, and I okay. think that's important too for me. Mm -hmm. um, someone who went to art school and got an MFA in art, I really understand some of the craft behind the process, sure. and I, I respect that very mm -hmm. much. 
and I feel very intimidated. Or I did feel very intimidated around other writers. Okay. I didn't want to see. I didn't really see myself as a writer. Okay. I saw myself as a photographer and a painter. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started going away to these writer's retreats every summer when I had a chance. Okay. And I've gone away each summer for the last four years. And I go away for about a week and I work with some pretty incredible writers from around the country. Um, people who have been published, have books and articles in New Yorker and Yankee Magazine and stuff. And, um, and I've realized, you know, with some great feedback that I belong there yes. as a writer. Yes. Uh, and that's, that's been really satisfying and empowering. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm planning going back again this year in May. Mm -hmm. There's this one place I love going to. It's called the Malay Colony for the Arts. It's mm. named after Edna St. Vincent Malay, a great Mainer herself, who's okay. a great poet. And there's a great writer's colony in upstate New York. And okay. I'm looking forward to going back. My mom more, I hope. You know, I have a goal of getting it done by the end of this year. Wonderful. Uh, hopefully published by sometime a year from now. Yeah. Yeah. Are you self-publishing? Do you have a publisher? No, I've, I've talked to a couple different publishers okay. already. I have a couple other writer friends who are helping me along. They, they yeah. give me great feedback along the way. That's important. So I haven't decided if it's self-publishing or whether I can get a publisher on board yep. um, to get to that final step. Yep. You know, but it's exciting, but That's it does take discipline. It takes discipline, and I'm going to imagine it's a memoir. Yes. Yes, that it could be emotionally very draining as <laughs> well. Um, it, it is. Yeah. You know, um, it's, I realize that just with my writing, because it's mostly about me and my work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, and I also recognize that in the stuff I do is the work for Equality Maine and Me Transnet. So much of my work is about my identity. Yeah. And it's a lot about sharing, and some it's very emotional. I deal with some mm -hmm. trauma in my life. Um, it can be very draining. Yes. You know, but I also it's also rewarding. Mm -hmm. You know, where you get feedback and people are giving you information and saying, "Hey, that really helped to hear what it was like right. for you." I had no idea, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I know there's another side to it. Yes, it's draining. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm hopeful this is just the first of many stories. Yes. You know? yep. um, I'd love to share some stories of my family's past. You know, my mm -hmm. mom's side of the story, her, her French-Canadian, Arcadian heritage from Nova Scotia. Mm. Pretty incredible past. And my dad's yeah. side of the family from Ireland. I'd love to sort of encapsulate that and be the family storyteller. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so we, we have that to look forward to I then. I hope so. Oh, I hope so too. Um, I was actually hoping that you would share some pages, but I hadn't told you that. Um, I didn't bring my book. But they have Sorry. a you have a blog, and you, you got thirty thousand. So actually, I do know a little bit about this process, and it is a, I think a good possibility that a publisher would pick up on that. Um, well, you know, I think right now mm -hmm. it, where we are in, in sort of the state of trans awareness, mm -hmm. there's never been a point like this ever in history, as far as we know. Right. No. Where so many people yeah. are talking about transgender issues. Yes. You know, when I was a kid growing up, um, there was one, like, conversation in 1974. Mm. Uh, Renee Richards, I don't know if you know Renee Richards. Mm -mm. She was a tennis player. Okay. And she wanted, she was a really good tennis player on the male side. Um, and she began to transition, she transitioned, mm. and she wanted to play in the U.S. Open as Renee Richards. Okay. Uh, and the U.S. Open said no. Mm. And she sued, and it went to the New York Supreme Court, and she won. Mm. And she got to play the, ne the following year as a woman, and it was, she was on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and here oh. I was, this little kid, noticing this transgender person in the, in the early, early mid-70s. And then there's this gap of 30-some years, maybe mm -hmm. more, mm -hmm. where there really hasn't been a national conversation about being trans. You mm. know, it wasn't until the mid-2000s when we started to see some peaks, you know, when like Chaz Bono came out yes, on yes. Dancing with the Stars and yep. his book. And then there's Laverne Cox, and she was featured on Time Magazine in 2014. Mm -hmm. The tipping point, transgender tipping point. Yeah, the tipping yeah. point. And just yep. last year, you know, one of my heroes growing up, being an athlete, mm -hmm. is Caitlyn Jenner. And yep. she came out last year mm -hmm. on the cover of Vanity Fair and, and spoke at the ESPY Awards. Yep. You know, and I think that's really powerful. It really is that yeah. now there's a time and a place where people all over the country are talking about transgender issues that have never been talked to for, before. And yeah. I think that's exciting. And I think there's a space right now for people like us to share our stories with the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'm very grateful for that myself, personally, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, I've got two questions that I want to ask. Um, one is because I, you know, you, you did disclose that you were 45 when you transitioned. Was that, is that yeah, correct? Probably 43. I oh, think. 43. So 43, 30, 40, So, 40, yeah. I mean, 43 years as a perceived male. Sure. Um, that comes with some privilege. 
<laughs> and uh, I'm because almost all of my interviews it kind of comes up the sure. idea of privilege yeah. and I'm wondering would you mind addressing that what is it like to have 43 years being perceived as a cisgendered male yeah and now you're a trans woman sure um, talk about that yeah that's, I'm glad you brought up privilege you know it's something mm -hmm. that I talk about a lot in the work that I do mm -hmm. you know um, I'm very fortunate where I am right now okay you know I have a job uh, I have a house that I live in, I have health care, you know, I have a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Life's pretty good for me. Right. You know, and that is not the case for, for most transgender people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the barriers that pe transgender people face are sometimes insurmountable, mm. depending on their race, depending on their religion possibly, depending on their poverty, things like that. You know, and so I'm aware now. Mm -hmm. um, that I have some pretty incredible privileges out there in the world. That mm -hmm. I, was, I grew up in a pretty middle class family. Right. Okay. I was able to go away to college. You know, there was always a meal at the table growing up. Mm. Things like that. You know, I never questioned it. I grew up, you know, raised in a Christian values society, mm -hmm. you know, way, which is like our society. And so, I wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. It's only recently now that I'm in this trans world, okay. and I'm starting to see some of the other things that that other people are struggling with. Mm -hmm. You know, um, especially transgender women of color. Mm -hmm. You know, this past year has been a horrific, the last two years have been horrific Absolutely. in terms of violence against transgender people, um, especially transgender women of color mm -hmm. who are being murdered, just mm. murdered for who they just are. Just for who they are. You know, and yeah. I, I don't feel that threat against me. I, I am worried and concerned about sexual violence against mm -hmm. me because mm -hmm. um, I know that is a concern. I know there's violence against transgender men and transgender women. Mm -hmm. So that's a new concern for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was actually curious when you were talking about that because... I can just imagine as a you know walking around as a guy not being concerned mm. about that, and this might, must be kind of new. Yeah. I mean, not new now because you've been doing yeah. it for six years, but it had to be new when you were first starting off. Yeah, it's a different feeling. Sure, it's definitely a different feeling. You know, I will say, when I started going to college, I definitely started interacting with more of a bisexual or gay circle. Okay. Yeah, and I remember for the first time getting jumped when I was in, in college because mm. I was being perceived probably as this sort of scrawny. Gay boy. Okay. You know, I remember these these guys circling me and jumping me and beating me up and taking my, oh, my stuff. Oh, okay. Well. Um, so I remember that. Um, but now it's a little different in the world. Now that I walk the world openly as a woman, mm -hmm. I am a lot more conscientious mm -hmm. of my surroundings, who I see, who I date, mm -hmm. and I'm learning. You know, just yeah. last year I started actually going out into the world and dating. I, I've been afraid of doing that. Sure. You know, and I went to a club with some friends and I met up with this guy and I. One thing turned to another. I'm like, wait, I don't, this is a new place for me. Yep. You know, how do I talk about who I am? Do I share mm -hmm. with this person that I'm trans? Mm -hmm. Do I disclose that? Mm. Um, safety issues. It's yep. a safety, but I hadn't yep. been in that situation before. Right. And do I go home with them? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, right. I was fortunate at that point. My girlfriend said, not tonight, not yet. <laughs> give, give him another chance or something. Yep. But those are things I never really thought about. Right. You know, but right. I do know that I've had some incredible opportunities along the way, growing up in a middle-class family, mm -hmm. being educated, being able-bodied. Because mm -hmm. um, there was actually a, a, a really strange story. When I was a teenager, mm -hmm. like I said earlier, I used to dress in some clothes, mm -hmm. and I actually used to sneak out of the house. Okay. <laughs> Very common, actually, yeah. you know. Yep. <laughs> and sometimes I would drop a bag out the window and sneak out at night and walk around my neighborhood. Uh, and then later, when I got my license, or maybe actually before I got my license, uh, I would take the car out. Okay. <laughs> and I, right? And I would actually like go drive around the block, take my bag, dress in my girl clothes, mm. and then I would drive all around Boston from like midnight to like 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. and playing, playing the music and playing Madonna and whatever, mm -hmm. having a great time. But I remember one night, it was Boston, I, and I was somewhere like on Mass Ave at like 3 a.m., took a right turn, and there was a cop behind me, and mm. the lights start flashing, and I'm like, go by me, go by me. Oh. And uh, he stops, pulls me over. Okay. Here I am. So I'm like 19, 18 years old. I'm, at then I was pretty muscular. I'm dressed in this skinny, tight dress with this really cheap wig, <laughs> horrible makeup. <laughs> and he comes up to the door and he kind of looks at me and, and I'm nervous and I'm sweating and I'm like, oh no. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, what's wrong, officer? He goes, did you know you, you know, ran that light or whatever? And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. He goes, what are you doing out here? It's like three in the morning. I'm like, oh, I just borrowed my parents' car. I'm out for a ride. And he kind of looked at me and said, where do you live? I said, you know, it's the suburb. And he goes, well, you better get home before your parents miss you. Okay. I said, okay. 
You know, it wasn't until recently that I realized how friggin' lucky I was. Mm. You know, imagine if I had been a young trans woman of color mm -hmm. driving around the, in this fancy car oh, in Boston goodness, at yeah. 3 a.m. dressed yeah. like yeah. I was. I would have been called in mm -hmm. or like stolen car, yep. sex worker or right. whatever. But a I got whole a free host of assumptions. I got a free pass. Yeah. I got a free pass because I was from the suburb. Yeah. So I was white. I was educated. I could talk and things like that and mm -hmm. communicate with the police officer. And so I, mm. I was let off. And so I didn't understand that until just about three or four years ago. And I realized, wow, I've had a lot of sort of lucky breaks and privileges just because of mm -hmm. things were given to me sure. that I was born into. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now, I'm curious. Another question I hear sometimes um, people will ask me, Matthew, are. Uh, do you consider yourself a trans guy or just a guy? Uh -huh. And I'm curious, Gia, do you consider yourself a trans woman, just a woman? Do you see any differences? Um, That's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, a little loaded, I suppose. A lot there, yeah. you know, and yeah. I, I think many women would say just a woman mm -hmm. would be a, you know, downgrade. I think, you know, being a woman is a pretty incredible thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I have the added element of being a transgender woman. Mm -hmm. Trans is fine too. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't even mind transsexual either. It's okay. actually a term I'm comfortable with. Sure. Yep. Um, yep. And so, yeah, I'm a trans woman. I'm a woman. And, but that's not just, that's only a small little slice of my identity. Sure. Okay. You know, and sometimes when I introduce myself to audiences, I talk about all the other things that, you that make me me. Yeah. You know, I'm a writer, I'm an artist, photographer, nature lover, mm -hmm. I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm an aunt, yep. I'm a godmother, you know, I'm a triathlete, I'm a marathon runner, I'm all these things. Yep. And I happen to be trans. Yes. Too. Right. You know, and so mm -hmm. it's a part of who I am, but it mm -hmm. doesn't describe all of who I am as a person. Okay. I have to, if you don't mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience. Sure. Originally, I would just say I'm a guy. Yeah. And um, what occurred to me was that I didn't have the collective experience of a cisgendered male and that mm -hmm. my experience as a trans guy was different. Sure. And so I kind of wanted to honor both. Yeah. And so I'm now comfortable saying, you know, I'm a trans guy. And to me that um, it doesn't make me unequal. It makes me a different kind of guy on the spectrum of, sure. of maleness. Okay. And uh, for me, it's just sort of acknowledging that, you know, I haven't had that collective male yeah. experience sure. and that mine is a bit unique and so that's where I come from. Um, yeah, you know I get that a lot. I think there's a lot of push and pull on that topic sure. of trans person versus person. Right, right. Or right. woman versus trans woman. Right. And there's definitely pushback in some communities against trans women being women. Right. Um, I have been hearing this. Sure. Yes. Or yeah. trans men not being, being men. men. Yes. Um, you know and I think there's this idea well you weren't socialized mm -hmm. as a girl, mm -hmm. right? Or you weren't socialized as a boy, or you've never menstruated, or you've never given birth, or all these things. Mm -hmm. And there are millions of women who've never given did birth, these right. things. Maybe they weren't socialized as a girl. Maybe they grew up in a community of all men, or all brothers, and all mm -hmm. whatever. Or maybe they have a, were born without a uterus, or maybe they can't give birth, or all okay. these things. There are plenty of exceptions to the idea. That's a great point. Thank you, you know, and yeah. so what it means to be a woman is is broad. There yeah. isn't just one way to look what it means to be a woman or a man. Um, but I will go back to what it feels like today versus okay. what it felt like five years ago when okay. it came out to the world. Um, I've been very fortunate and once again privileged to be able to work with my mental health professionals mm -hmm. and my doctors to transition not just socially but also medically. Yep. You know, and so over the last couple of years through hormones and some surgery I've been able to sort of align my identity with my mm -hmm. body to a better degree. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm feeling a lot more whole and a lot more at okay. peace with myself than yep. ever before. Mm -hmm. um, but I also notice that I'm not seen as trans as often as mm -hmm. I used to be when I first came out. Mm -hmm. And so when I walk into spaces or I'm walking up and down the street on Congress Street, I don't get the same looks as I used to get. Sure. Or the stares yep. or the parents hurting their children away from me. Mm -hmm. um, when I first came out, because there was this, is that a guy in a dress? What is that? What is that? Danger, a threat. Right, right. And yeah. now I have this sort of like, yeah. I don't, I'm not seen as trans so quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I have this privilege now mm -hmm. where I'm seen more as cis, even yep. though I'm not. Right. And it's not intentional because right. I'm very proud of my identity as a sure. trans woman. Sure. It's just the, the way it is. Yep. 
Uh, and so I've had to, I'm learning how to come to terms with being seen as not trans mm -hmm. in many spaces. And just, yep, that I'm just Gia and I'm here. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes it doesn't come up in conversations. Mm -hmm. I find that refreshing myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm at a point in my life, to be honest, where it's sort of like, yep, I'm trans. You got 20 minutes. Ask what you want, and then yeah. we're moving on. <laughs> well, that, that brings up a really good point about um, everyone having expectations that trans people are here to teach us. Yes. Have you, I mean, I think there's a, a lot of us have that experience mm -hmm. where people want to learn about what it means to be trans, and mm -hmm. they have like a litany of questions yeah. to ask you where you're obligated to teach them. Right everything about trans in right. 10 minutes. Right. And if they ever have a question, they can give you a call or send you a mm -hmm. Facebook post and post on your wall. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this? Right, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's to me just as ludicrous as expecting a person of color to be a representative of that entire of course. population. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think it's kind of interesting. And some people are willing Mm -hmm. to share their experiences, mm -hmm. but they shouldn't be obligated. Right. You know, right. Me, it's my job. I've chosen to sort sure. of follow this field where I go out into the world and talk about my identity, talk about the trans experience, but I've met hundreds if not thousands of transgender people now in the last four or five years in the work mm -hmm. that I do. And so when I talk about the trans experience, it's my experience, but I'm mindful of all the other people I'm, that I've met and I kind of bring that to light. Okay. My experience is very different versus mm -hmm. someone else's experiences in maybe rural Maine. Right. Or in, or yeah. in, in Alabama or somewhere else sure. or, in, or in Russia. Yep. Um, and so I'm very aware of that. Um, okay. And it's my job to talk about what it means to be trans and how to be a better advocate to the entire community. Yeah, terrific. Um, I love to ask this question okay. um, because I feel like the, the narrative of being trans often is um, negative um, and it's painful and right now it really is. Um, as, as you know, awareness didn't translate into acceptance. I mean, our violence did increase 31 percent. Sure. And, and as we know, statistics are quite limited, yeah. um, so it means it was probably higher. Yeah. But I think there's a lot to be grateful for. Sure. And I'm curious uh, what you are grateful for, for being a gender diverse trans person. Okay. Um, I think that's a hard question to sort of maybe answer shortly. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for a long time, I, I, I didn't know how to understand or embrace my identity as a trans okay. person. And so I, and I felt a lot of shame and embarrassment about it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of internalized transphobia, which is sort of hate of yeah. being trans. And I've internalized that and in turn hated myself sure. for being trans. Yep. Uh, and I, you know, in the process of coming out uh, and embracing my identity as a trans person, I've had to come to terms with my own self-hate, my own transphobia. Yeah. Um, and I know people who've had a horrible experience. Mm -hmm. They've lost everything. They've yes, lost they their have. family, they've lost their kids, they've lost their jobs, mm -hmm. and they curse being trans. They mm -hmm. think it's the worst thing that's ever happened to them. Mm -hmm. And I can't blame them, mm -hmm. you know? And bad things have happened to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I lost my partner of 20 years. Mm -hmm. I lost my job. At first, I lost my family. They're now back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I lost some friends. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I am much happier now than I've ever been before. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I see tr being trans as, as kind of, I don't like the word gift because that implies <coughs> something that I don't agree with, but it's something that's really special. Okay. And I know in many indigenous communities, mm -hmm. um, people who are trans or maybe two-spirit in some native yeah. communities, we're seen as sort of like really unique and special and mm -hmm. revered. Mm -hmm. And I think trans people can offer something to the world that other people can't. Mm -hmm. You know, where I've have lived a, lived a life now, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, 50 years, where I've seen both sides mm -hmm. of the story and a little of the in between. Yep. And so, you know, I think being trans is pretty special. You know? I do too. I think it offers a very unique lens on how to, you know, how yeah. to look at the world. I per personally, at least, I mean, I'm limited to sort of the Portland area. Okay. But thinking. Um, it just seems trans folks are really resilient and really yeah. empathetic, in my my opinion. Sure. Um, and I found a tremendous amount of community. Yeah. I think we're we're really developing our community um, in part because we're growing. Okay. And, um, but that for me is something I'm grateful for. I'm right. actually grateful that 
Um, I didn't feel grateful initially when right. I transitioned yeah. because it was sort of like, why did I take so long? Why did it, you know? Yeah. But now I'm really grateful because it's sort of like, wow, I lived, you know, 42 years as a perceived mm -hmm. woman. Um, and I, kn I know very well what women go through. Sure. Um, and now I have a unique position of how people perceive me, rightly so, as a male mm -hmm. and, and what goes along with that. Right. Um, so I feel that was such a gift. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. good. You know, I think you brought up a couple of things about that that I, I think we should talk probably talk about is, you know, the sense of community, mm -hmm. you know, and we're very fortunate here in yeah. definitely in the Portland er area yeah. and some other areas around Maine to have some community and strength in community. I think yes. that really is important because mm -hmm. so many trans people don't have strong support from their families. No. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, and I think that's unfortunate, but mm -hmm. it's changing. It is. You know, and I, some of the work I do is with young people um, and with families. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, and we talk a little bit about some of the, some of the horrible statistics and suicide as being one of them mm. and depression and things like that. And, you know, knowing that the suicide rate is astronomical, nine to ten times higher than people who aren't trans, yeah. let's say, right? Yep. But there are ways to combat that and change mm. that. Mm -hmm. And probably the number one thing you could do is, you know, having a supportive family. Mm -hmm. It really Thank is. You for and, and in light of a supportive family, having a supportive community. Yes. And so in lieu of a supportive family, having a community. And so that's some of the work that I'm doing is to make sure families are on board, are educated and understand that trans is real. Mm -hmm. It's not a curse. And mm -hmm. your kid, your child can have a wonderful life. Yes. And if your family's not with you right now, we have this great community here in Maine. Yes. Gia, this has been a fantastic interview. I thank you so much. Um, you're just so warm and engaging. Um, so I want to thank my viewers for watching and tuning in to Gender Dignity, Unique and Equal. And once again, introducing you to just an ordinary person who has really overcome some insurmountable odds. Um, she's your neighbor. She's your friend. She's your coworker. She is, I believe, probably one of the most visible trans people in Maine. Uh, I have profited immensely from her advocacy. And um, thank you so much, and we'll do this again next month.